fucking master of defense and self delusion. Slave to competitive accumulation that never feels quite profitable enough at this primeval moment. Sacred, heroic time of earthly upheaval. I know you're feeling it. Things are getting just a little bit rough. Unleashing a perfect storm of astronomical, geological, biological, and experiential metamorphosis. I stand before you here today, triumphantly reveling in the apotheosis of your hubris. The nervousness that is part and parcel of um, performance that scares the living daylight out of me every time. Partially because my information is antagonistic to the dominant culture. I, I do feel that I'm putting myself at risk somehow, sometimes. I was sent to open Your illusions of humanity's infallible march of technological progress to the stars. Here at the end of the finite fossil fuel driven industrial age, you won't even make it to Mars. Faith in perpetual economic growth measured by GDP, foisted on you by the parasitic oligarchy is lost when the too big to fail financial institutions, mired in unpayable debt, can't find the key to your prosperity at any cost. Keeping off fires is not an easy thing. Reforestation is not an easy task. It was not just like a nice fairy tale story of living in the forest happily ever after. It continued to be a lot of hard work and sacrifice and dedication to this, you know, whole movement of caring for the earth. Sometimes I see fires from that point there, then I know where Lady Young, Chancellor. I'm on fire patrol right now. <laughs> yeah. I was coming home from Forestry Division, that St. Joseph, and then I look up and I saw the Northern Range on fire. I saw the Aryan fires coming around the savannah. I was just seeing smoke and just like, and I just wanted to reach. I just wanted to reach. And I just started to run up the mountain and only to notice the fire was right in front of the door. And my mom, she was really, really, I was seeing that fear on her face, you know? And uh, then I just, yeah, it was like, I didn't, I really didn't know what to do. Yeah, because we didn't have like all the fire team and all the stuff yet and, and so on in place. And I think that was really, really, really hard for me. Um, seeing my baby, you know, on fire in front of the door and my mother and me, you know. And um, I could never forget that. The closest the fire, you know, yeah, reached in terms of literally like, okay, I'm entering, I'm gonna take away everything. My job as an artist to bring about the mental change, to change minds, to change um, thinking in the culture. From 1987, when I first saw the watershed burn down, I was crossing the stage with Minchel's um, Carnival is Color Band. I looked up on the St. Anne's Ridge and it was burning down. And I just knew that this is, you know, this cannot be, we cannot let that situation stay the way it is. I realized um, it's going to be my life's calling to put a canopy back on that ridge. That, that, that just went through me. Meeting Akila and finding out about the reforestation project that she and her husband had started, um, that's how we really we got, we got started. The GAP is all about Glenham coming together for a positive cause, and our cause is forest fire prevention. Our official GAP started in 1996 to commemorate the passing of my dad, one of the late co-founders. He passed away in 1994. When he was alive, he used to rally a lot of guys around from the community to help cut fire breaks and kill air fire traces in preparation for the dry season. The 
But yeah, I, 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 yeah. Fight, I fight a good bit of fire. And fighting it was easy. Before you reach up and on it, you're feeling like it. If I have mm. a weight, have a tongue. We had to try and keep that tongue down. He mm. just spill out in the end. Yeah, you had to try to keep them down. Try to move all the foods away from him. Mm-hmm. When you beat a fire here, you, I see a fire, you beat a fire here, you saw it pop up here. Mm-hmm. But yeah. running underneath the top. What? Sometimes you're here dealing with one, and that same one, you don't know where you end up behind. dry season is always a, the most daunting time for us. I think people really don't understand that emotional drain that it puts on you. It's just like a mental wreck. I'm in school and I'm thinking about fire. I'm, I'm thinking about fire. And um, I just could never understand how not that many people seem to be bothered enough to, to want to see something different happen. Because you have to be bothered enough. I mean, you could be bothered, but you know, how bothered? So it was quite a shocking thing for me to, to think about. This is my watershed. This is the watershed that I was born in and I grew up in. And having spent a decade in Canada and finding out about the bioregional movement, I decided to move back to this watershed in order to implement the bioregional vision. I'm sitting on bare rock on the top of the St. Anne's Ridge. At one point, this would have been a forest. There would have been trees 60 to 100 feet tall at this spot. People will they look up from down there and they say, but the hills are green, it's fine. But the point is, the biodiversity is reduced to just one species. And biodiversity is what makes life and ecosystems functional and resilient and able to withstand shocks. You only have one species with a few struggling pioneer species trying to come up and then every year they get burnt. This is a disaster. Where we are here at the end of the fire trace, the canopy in the ravine is right here. The transition is very dramatic. We have big trees that have survived up until now. The fire used to come right up to here, but it has not burned here for a long, long time. But you can see the ferns dominating the slopes out on the ridge. When my parents started off here, there wasn't a big buy-in. People were buying all kind of whatever they buy when they get paid. My father was buying trees. He had so many children to take care of, but he was still buying trees because that was important. I always look at the hills and say, you know, if you could live up in the hills. And, you know, I just wanted to be like, you know, connected to that level. And then seeing people running from the hills, running from fires, no trees. This was just like from the road, go way up. You can look and just see brown landscapes and gray and brown during the dry season and fires and the smell of animals and so on. Being with Takuma and looking at the pattern of farming, I encouraged him. I say, here we're going on. Let us go into long term farming. And with that, Takuma started to buy fruit trees and so on. And, and then he had that new responsibility of protecting those trees during the dry season. Yeah, and um, yes, after Takuma died, I was told um, to move out of the hills with these little baby children and get some apartment somewhere and, you know, and stuff like that. And I choose to stay. I said, no, I will stay and I'll continue to work. Yeah, there was friends at Akuma. Well, I was a little boy growing up, so I didn't know how much friends there were, but 
they was good friends. They used to come and hang out and cook and them as a youth man. I used to be amongst them. And I wait till the food done and get a bowl of a soup. And they would pull the square in a truck and a corner and sit down and laugh and smoke and reason. And I could just be around, you know. Yeah, it's real, it real nice. And then that whole mountain there, it is ripe yellow. Pui. Yeah, it look real nice. Yeah, some big trees, you know. If I come all the way down to the end, down there, I'm burning. Don't, don't shit down to the, the end. They used to have nearly every year. There are more seen. I sit a small grass, I ain't seen no big trees. You can see you straight up the hill. The you can't see up the hill. And it's very really hurtful to see because I don't know what can I mango, cause be sucking a mango because a mango will be rolling down the hill. But the fire destroyed. I don't know if we going up there and we getting cooked or not. Anything, but the fire take away all that joy. So I try to create my little joy here. Now. I'm not giving up on this little joy here. So if I give up on it, I ain't go get it. Let the fire keep coming, 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 coming. We got to love mama nature. We got to love us. You see, I remember my uncle, when, we, when he done cook, he go say, God, make sure I go in the pot. Huh? As you know, when he passed back, it's all over. It's all over. Yeah. Wash it, if you want more food, wash the pot and put it back on the fire. <laughs> One time I said, oh, where does milk come from? The grocery, or where does water come from? Wasser. If you ask kids that some years ago, say 20, 30 years ago, they would say river, because their reality might be that they have to go to the river to tote water. I think growing up as a kid here, I just wouldn't have any clue of how different it was. It was a very outdoorsy childhood, uh, spending a lot of time in the river, a lot of time running up and down the forest, finding all the insects, finding tarantulas, finding um, different types of, of bugs. I always hear older people talk about all the wildlife, they would see, they would see this, they would see that, and I was like, I know they kill it out, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to see it. I want to be able to see as much as I can see. We used to have a lot of deer as well as um, um, the ocelot, but we don't see any of those things along this side now because they would go further and further into areas that are not um, affected as much as this side of the ridge. <laughs> so the first project that the foundation is doing is to, uh, yes, is to regenerate the Port of Spain watershed. Bio is the word for life, so bio region is a life place, a unique geography unique plants and animals, <clears throat> and unique human cultures that co-evolve, that, that develop alongside those particular plants and animals in that particular geography. And so before the advent of empires and conquering tribes, all human beings lived in bi-regions, and you could actually determine the boundary of a bi-region by the language. So, now that Western civilization is collapsing, we have to look at new ways to live again. And there are some people who are looking back at that bi-regional way of living. Well, living in balance with the particular bi-region that you call home. Okay. And what do you think about this, Corolla? 
every dry season, we used to print flyers and give it to the neighbors of the forest. Yeah. The children might hear about it in school. If the parents not implementing it at home in the areas where the fire taking place, mm -hmm. it won't really be serving no purpose. One, we know for sure it's education at all levels, from preschool, to primary school, the politicians, all levels. We just call everything bush. But what do you think really burns? It's all the animals, all the wildlife, all the agouti, the manicure, the snake, the birds, kobo, they nest inside the rocks and their chicks look like little puppies. I mean, and they can't fly yet, they have no wings. I think now the Australian example, the way how the media captures or sensationalizes a story that is worth sensationalizing is done differently. Whereas in Trina, the only thing we tend to sensationalize and keep in the media for a longer period of time tends to be crime and corruption with no real results. If we really sensationalize all the things that happens within the environment, we could effect a great amount of change and evoke a lot of passion amongst people. They could say, well, okay, if my human action is causing this, you know, you can start a campaign for people to stop lighting fires. It's actually illegal. The fine has been increased from $1,500 to $20,000. So there is policy. But the whole thing there needs to be enforcement. In order to enforce a law to arrest somebody, somebody needs to call and report. So I think that public pressure is needed. People need to say, okay, we don't want this. Well, the Kobo is the highest flying creature of creation and is the one who is cleaning up the mess. It's my job to bring about the paradigm shift, to recognize that we're actually lovingly connected to all life on Earth, that we're not separate, and that until we start designing our politics and our economics that reflect our connection, we're going to continue messing up the system, both ecologically and um, between humans. Where the matrix that once held everything in place is returned to the primordial slime. And if you care to study peoples who have destroyed in this way, there's no shortage of places to find such desolation and decay. Wherever Aboriginal animists, land-based tribal societies in their home by region have been crushed under the wheels of my conquering swarm of salvationist religion. But I'll leave you now to attend to the ecological regeneration of the ecosystem I call home, joining with my neighbors to optimize for biodiversity in our watershed. No more will I roam. When we mine the soil life and catch and store rainwater and fertility high on the landscape, it will mind us. Planting food forests for wildlife, we will reap what we sow, there is no escape. It is in our biological communities we must trust. All our relations, ancestors, spirit guides, elemental beings, give thanks and praises for the many blessings we spur I and I, I sinually, I hope, all our relations. Gap is music, gap is food, gap is work, gap is fun. Gap is about advocacy, gap can be all kind of thing. Gap is we thing. Let's call on the ancestors and all the energies to be to guide us through this dry season, okay? Okay.
Talking about 